Thank you, Sam. And thank you all for joining us here today on the presentation of coordinating care with patients with substance use disorders in Virginia, privacy considerations. In September of 2019, Virginia Medicaid received $4.8 million federal planning grant to further increase access to evidence-based treatment services for opiate use disorder and other substance use disorders. The grant is administered through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services under the Support Act. Virginia is one of 15 states that were awarded this grant. The purpose of the grant is to increase substance use disorder provider workforce and increase the treatment capacity of providers participating in the state Medicaid program to offer substance use disorder treatment and recovery services. Virginia currently covers over 1.8 million individuals. The majority are gonna be enrolled in one of our six managed care health plans. In 2019, close to 100,000 members were identified with a substance use diagnosis. Thus, we appreciate the successful collaboration between providers and our managed care stakeholders, as we see this as significant in coordinating access to the most appropriate care. Virginia Medicaid has contracted with Manat, Phelps, and Phillips as part of the work of the Support Act grant to perform a policy landscape review of Virginia's approach to Medicaid coverage of substance use disorder treatment and recovery services. As part of the work with the Support Act grant, Manat is identifying options to, for Medicaid to strengthen treatment and recovery, including understanding privacy considerations for coordinating care for patients with substance use disorders. We thank you for participating today and your willingness to work with us to address this major public health concern affecting our members, our economy, and the social well being of our communities and families. Note that this webinar today is funded through the Virginia Support Act grant, and we will be recording this session and uh, present and publishing it on the Virginia Medicaid's Support Act grant website. And now I would like to introduce our Manat team, Alex Forkowitz who's a partner with the Nat Health, and Jocelyn Geyer, who is the Managing Director with the Nat Health. Jocelyn, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ashley. And we really appreciate the chance to be here today and to be part of this conversation. Um, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit what we're hoping to cover in this call, why we're covering it. And then I am going to turn it over to Alex, who is our legal guru um, and will be helping all of us, I think, to navigate and understand the privacy and security laws that can come into play as we all think about how to strengthen treatment for people with substance use disorders. So we are gonna do a, uh, some background on part two, 42 CFR part two, which Alex will talk through, but is typically the primary federal law regulation that governs at the end of the day, much of what can happen with respect to exchange of information um, related to someone with substance use disorders. We are gonna touch on some of the other health privacy laws, um, but it's gonna be a little bit heavier on 42 CFR part two, because that tends to be the dominating driver. Of, of interactions. And then we're very excited because really the purpose of this is to get you all some very practical examples, scenarios that will feel familiar, hopefully, um, where maybe you've struggled in the past. What can I share? When can I reach out? Under what circumstances? For how long? And so we're going to spend some time on those practical use cases and kind of take the information Alex has shared and think about how it would apply in practice. Um, and then we'll go to some of those questions that we know tend to come up again and again. And if we have some time, we'll do some additional Q&A. Sam said it at the beginning, but I really want to highlight it. We would love it if as we go along, you can just shoot any and all questions that come to mind. It can be totally basic. What is 42 CFR part two? It can be, I had this scenario the other day. How should I think about this? Um, but I think that will help this material come to life as we go through it. So let's go to the next slide. And just to say on that note, that very much is the goal of this conversation is in light of the work that people do day to day with individuals have, who have substance use, how do we make sense of, how do we understand, how do we make sure we don't run afoul of federal and state privacy rules that inevitably come up 
as we are exchanging information about patients with substance use disorder. Um, and to, in particular, think about it, we know many of you are care coordinators or work with care coordination agencies or are in that role to think about as the folks that are often transmitting information and trying to pull services together for people, these privacy and security issues through the lens of, of that experience and that very important piece of substance use disorder treatment. Let's go to slide six. So we are gonna go pretty heavy on the legal environment. And so before we do that, and before I turn it to Alex, I just wanna note what I think many of us know well and live with every day, which is the legal environment is important. Um, you know, but it sits in the context of a much broader frame around the importance of privacy and security for people who are in substance use disorder treatment. And there is a long history here. And those of us that have been in treatment or a family or friends are in treatment or do treatment know there are very good reasons why people feel strongly that their information be kept private and secure given the stigma and sometimes frankly well beyond the stigma, potential legal consequences of people learning and understanding what's going on with their substance use situation. So just wanna say up front, we're gonna get pretty legal, but we understand and, and wanna keep at the front of everyone's mind. This is very much about how we protect people so they feel comfortable participating in light of some of that stigma, some of those issues we're all working on, but that are still out there in a reality for folks. Um, and we don't want people to feel like they could face discrimination or legal consequences. So we will be going in on the federal and state privacy requirements, but um, recognize and just, again, wanna lift up, know that there are additional considerations, including it can really affect the therapeutic relationship if you're working with someone who is not confident that that their information will be private and secure. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Alex, who is going to help us with those legal aspects, um, even as we all, of course, take a, a broader approach as, as we do this work. So Alex, do you want to jump in and start us on part two? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Um, and, and thank you all for attending today. Um, I hope, hope we all hope this is useful to, to you and, and your work you do every day. Um, so, so let's start with the basics. And, and so first question is, what is 42 CFR Part 2? Um, so 42 CFR Part 2 is, is a federal law. It's a federal regulation. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's issued by SAMHSA. And it's really the primary law that governs the confidentiality of substance use disorder records. Um, and it's known, uh, it's known as a fairly strict law. Uh, uh, so why, why is it strict? What makes it strict? Um, the, there, there's, there are a lot of reasons why it, it tends to be stricter than other uh, health privacy laws such as HIPAA. Um, but I think the primary one is this concept of written consent for purposes of treatment and care coordination. So under HIPAA, Generally, um, if you have two providers or a provider in a health plan, if they're coordinating care for a patient or another individual, um, they can share information with one another um, without the written consent of the patient. Um, that's, that's HIPAA, there's Virginia laws that reflect that as well. That's not the position of part two. Under part two, you typically do need written consent for a lot of different uses of information that's subject to part two. Um, um, even for these care coordination purposes. Um, and so why, why is it that? Why is it strict? I mean, it sort of goes back to, to what Jocelyn was just talking about. You think about the history of this law. This, this was, there was a statute passed in the early 70s, and then the regulations emerged out of that statute. And at the time, it was the country, there went ways are similar to what's going on today. There was a, a real, a large increase in heroin use. Um, there was more of a development of, of clinics and other providers that would provide care to those with substance use disorders. Uh, and there was a real concern um, about uh, confidentiality. Um, you know, heroin use is obviously is not, is not legal. Um, and there was concern that law enforcement uh, might really target patients 
um, that they might, and there, there was even parts of the regulations that talk about undercover agents sitting in on these sessions um, and using it to investigate and, and perhaps arrest people. So, so that's sort of what the genesis of, of, of these strict requirements are, is that you know, the goal was, look, we don't want patients to worry about um, them discussing you know, drug use and worry about being arrested or some other bad consequences happening to them. We want them to be comfortable talking with their practitioners. And so we're gonna make it really hard to share their information. So that's that's what happened in the early 70s. That's what the law that passed and the regulations that emerged from that. Um, and so we see that reflected in the requirements today, you know, 50 years later. Next slide, please. So when does 42 CFR part two apply? Now, if there's one important takeaway is that it doesn't apply to all substance use disorder records. There's, there's a lot of information about someone having a substance use disorder that just isn't subject to this, this regulation at all. So how do we know what is subject to part two? Really, really there's three things. As in order to be subject to this law, you need uh, first it has to be identifiable information. And it needs to be information in particular that identifies someone as having or having had a substance use disorder. Um, it could also count if you if you suggest that someone has a substance use disorder, right? So uh, it may not include an actual diagnosis, but if it talks about having someone gone to a particular clinic that specializes in substance use disorder treatment, uh, that could be enough, right? So first it needs to be identifiable, and then that also means it can't be de-identified, right? So if it doesn't have name or any other identifiers that you could use to recognize a patient, um, it's not going to be subject to this law either. Second, it has to originate from a federally assisted program. Um, so federal assistance, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's a very broad category, right? If you participate, in, if a provider participates in Medicare or Medicaid, it's federally assisted. If it's nonprofit and has a tax exempt status, that's enough to be federally assisted as well, because the idea is the government is sort of assisting them by not taxing them. Um, there are others who fall into this category as well. So that's, that's really broad, that's almost everybody. Um, but the third one is sort of the real limitation here, which is the concept of holding yourself out. Um, so that really means that um, the provider should advertise their SUD services or have a specialty SUD license. If they, um, if they don't do either of those things, then they may not be subject to part two. And, and we'll talk about examples of that. If we can go to the next slide, please. So, a few examples of who is and who's not subject to part two typically. And the first is an opioid treatment program that participates in Medicare and Medicaid, right? It's federally assisted because it participates in these programs and opioid treatment program typically will have a license from the state um, saying that they're, they provide substance use disorder services. So they will generally follow part two and have to comply with it. Another example, uh, take say a, not, a primary care practice that's a nonprofit that you know, advertising on its website that it provides, you know, comprehensive substance use disorder care. So there's that holding yourself out element. They're advertising to the public that this is something that they do and they they have federal assistance or, or nonprofit. Uh, a psychiatric hospital that's also participating in Medicare and Medicaid um, and it has a specific license to provide SUD treatment. Again, it's, it's holding itself out because it has that license um, and it, it's, an, uh, it's getting federal assistance because it's in Medicare or Medicaid. Okay, so those, those, are who in, those are who are subject to part two, but who, who might not be? So a good example is emergency rooms, right? Typically emergency rooms do not advertise the fact that they provide substance use disorder care, but, but they do, right? They, have, they provide lots of treatments to a lot of different people, some of whom maybe may have overdosed or have other substance use disorders. The fact that they're treating those people and the fact that they write down a record that someone may have a substance use disorder doesn't make them subject to part two. Second is primary care mental health clinics uh, that do not advertise their SUD services or, or have an SUD license. Um, again, that they're not holding themselves out um, as, uh, as a substance use disorder provider. Another category is, is for-profit SUD providers. providers. These, these are not common. And there, I assume that this is not something that you all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but no, you know, think of those fancy commercials for these California clinics where celebrities go 
well, they, they may not be getting any federal assistance, right? They, they might just be uh, not participating in Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, that's an example of someone who might not be federally assisted and therefore not have to follow the law. And finally, those with the, the last category is an important one, um, practitioners with uh, data 2000 waivers. That one, it really depends, right? Um, you know, I think what says said is that the fact you have this waiver and you could provide medication assisted treatment doesn't necessarily make you subject to part two by itself. But if you go on, again, if you go to your website, if you start advertising, putting out pamphlets saying this is something you specialize in, you probably cross the line where you, have to, you do have to comply with part two. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so generally you do need written consent, um, but there are scenarios where you can disclose information without written consent. And we don't have to go through each one of these, but just picking out a few highlights, this disclosure of information can be made if needed to treat, provide treatment in a medical emergency. There's a research exception, there's an audit evaluation exception, um, and also patients have the right to your information. So you don't have to get a patient to sign a form to give the information to the patient. The patient just can ask for your own information and you can give it to them. Next slide, please. So assuming you do need uh, a patient's written authorization, um, none of the exceptions in the prior slide would apply. You have to get them, the patient to sign um, an authorization form, or you, you have to ask the patient to sign the form. If they say no, then you can't share the information, right? So there's detailed rules that about what needs to be in the form itself. Um, and you know, some of them are fairly obvious. You need a name, a signature and date, uh, an expiration date or event. Um, but one thing that can be a little tricky is this, this item about potential recipients, right? So generally speaking, you need to identify who the recipient is. Um, and you can have multiple recipients. It doesn't have to be just one uh, person or organization. And it's okay to have legal entities, right? So if you're going to share for a particular a Medicaid managed care plan or hospital, you don't have to name the actual people who work at that managed care plan or, or hospital. You just have to put the name of the plan or hospital on, on the form. Uh, the problem with this is that oftentimes, you know, people switch providers, right? So you could say, let's say a patient that comes in, signs a form, uh, says, you can share my information with primary care practice X. Okay, the next week the patient may switch primary care practices um, and they that patient may be totally fine with that new practice also receiving their information. But the form said the, had the name of the first practice on it. It doesn't have the name of their new practice on it. So they may have to go back um, and sign a new form. Um, there's a bit of more flexibility here when you make an exchange through an intermediary, intermediary such as an HIE, uh, but we don't have to Get into those details right now. Uh, next slide, please. And one other thing I want to mention is that about a year ago, almost today, the, um, the CARES Act was passed. And even though that had to deal mostly with COVID, um, it did have a provision regarding substance use disorder uh, confidentiality, section 3,221. Um, and it, it actually could be very important. Um, and it can may change some of the things we're talking about today. Um, the, the bottom line really is, is a few things. First, it kept in the requirement that patients need to sign a, a form for most disclosures. So you still have to ask patients for their written consent. But the difference is, is that the, the law is basically saying is that if you receive part two information, let's say you're a managed care plan that receives it, um, you have more flexibility in how you can disclose it. You, you, you don't have to go back and ask the patient to get another, sign another form, uh, assuming um, the disclosure would be allowed under HIPAA for, for certain purposes. Um, so it gives a little more flexibility, but in exchange for that flexibility, there's potential for more enforcement because it's sort of applying more, more federal penalties to this type of information. So there's a potential um, for more a more active federal government um, and maybe more fines for those who don't comply with the, this, these requirements. Um, next slide, please. And I think we might take a, a little pause here for, for a few questions. Uh, so Alex, um, we do have some questions that have been coming in as you've spoken. So I can go ahead and just 
flag a few of them. And thank you for those of you that sent in questions and, and please keep them coming. So um, one is, I know you had noted as an exception that a provider can share information with Child Protective Services um, if needed and appropriate. And yeah. I think that one of the questioners was looking for a little bit more detail and context on the circumstances under which disclosures are allowed or not allowed to Child Protective Services. So, uh, you know, I, ha I haven't actually spent a huge amount of time dealing with that particular exception. Um, I can, can we maybe come back to that one a little later in the session? Um, but, but, but maybe it's easier to talk that one out. Um, yep, 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 we can definitely do that. Okay, and then we had a question and I, I think you've, you've kind of addressed, but let's just go straight at it, which yeah. is um, do patients, do individuals need to be informed of their privacy practices? And is it like HIPAA as a provider, do you have to have yeah. documentation on hand that yeah. they've acknowledged it and that you've got the consent? What does that kind of look so like? So there is no equivalent requirement for notice of privacy practice under part two, but the new law that the, the CARES Act that passed last year um, did have a requirement to sort of, and, and again, it's not quite in effect yet, but it presumably will be in soon, um, to sort of revise your notice of privacy practices to talk about how you handle substance use disorder information. Um, so there will be some probably new regulations on that point soon. I mean, the, in theory, the regulations are supposed to be effective um, by March 27th, which is three days from now, um, <laughs> but they don't exist yet. Um, but yes, I think everyone should be on the lookout that you may have to be a little more careful about how you tell patients about how you share substance use disorder data. Yeah. And I am not the lawyer here, but I just wonder as a practical matter, especially if you're already doing HIPAA, if it's just going to make sense to go ahead and, and use very similar policies and procedures with respect to um, the part two requirements. Yeah. It like you could, couldn't hurt to do it. Well, I think the idea is it would be the same notice. It wouldn't be like a yeah. separate notice for it would yeah. be one paper. Yeah. I didn't do it. Um, okay, one more, and then we'll let, let you cover other privacy laws. Um, and this may get us into the use cases. So let us know if you wanna yeah. hold it or if you wanna go there now. But um, Virginia, I gather, is one of the states that has community service boards, essentially, and Ashley, you can help me if I'm getting this wrong, but kind of county level or community-based organizations that receive funding to do substance use disorder treatment. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, um, so the question was, or just looking for clarification, so just what you outline mean that a community service board does not have to share information with an MCO that is looking to provide care coordination for someone who's served by that community service board? Um, well, whether they, so they I guess there's a question of, is two questions about whether they're allowed to versus they're, whether they're required to, right? Those are two separate issues and, and sort of whether they're allowed to would gets into whether they are in fact part two programs. And, and I think you know, I, I guess I would defer to, I imagine they've already looked at this issue and I, I don't want to tell them who, who they are. I'm going to go with a yes, because yeah. they're specifically set up yeah. to provide substance use disorder. So, so I would say, I mean, this gets into another law, which we'll get into in a little bit, which is information blocking rules. But basically there is a bit more of an obligation now. It's also going into effect April 5th. So it's something that's coming up soon to share information when you are legally allowed to. So Assuming you're a part two provider, you're not required to share information if there's no written consent. But I think the idea is that you should, it, it changes a little bit because you can't kind of tell your patients, don't sign this form, right? That, that's potentially problematic now. You could, you could talk to them about um, the risks of sharing, right? You could say, you know, happy to have a conversation about whether you want us to provide consent or not. But if you really take efforts to block your patients from agreeing to share information, that's potentially problematic now. Okay. So maybe think about it. If, if the community service board had consent from the patient to share, they really would need to if the MCO reached out and asked for it. There's it's no consent on file. It's, it's, it's certainly not yeah. clear. Yeah, if there's no consent on file, then that's, that's a different issue. But if there is consent, then... I mean, it, again, it's, a, it's sort of a new uh, regulation, which is 
hasn't, again, it's not yet in effect yet. It's taking effect in two weeks, but um, it may change the dyna dynamic. And the, the basic idea behind it is if you are legally allowed to share data, share patient's information, um, you better have a good reason as to why you're not. That's in a nutshell, that's what it means, yeah, right? That's right. You know, um, and I wonder if that, maybe that actually takes us to, we've got some other great questions coming in, so keep them coming, but I wonder, Alex, since you're kind of going down this path of some yeah. of the other federal laws that are relevant, sure. why don't we go to that and we'll keep to talk about the questions and come back, some of which are part two specific. Okay, okay, so we can move on. Um, all right, so we'll go back to the deck, thank you. Um, just briefly, some other relevant laws, HIPAA, uh, you know, many of you may or be familiar with HIPAA. Um, you know, it, it's broader in its scope than part two in that it's not limited to, you know, substance use disorder data, but will uh, cover lots of different types of, of health information, medical histories, test results, insurance information, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Um, the main limitation of HIPAA is what it applies to. Um, it applies to what are called covered entities, which are health plans, healthcare providers, and, and quote, healthcare clearinghouses. We don't really need to worry about who healthcare clearinghouses are for purposes of today's discussion, but just know that Medicaid agencies and Medicaid MCOs are, are considered health plans, so they are subject to HIPAA. Um, and it also applies to their, the contractors of these organizations who handle um, protected health information in these contractors are called business associates. Um, and I, I mentioned this before, but the main difference between HIPAA and Part 2 really is, is that you have, under HIPAA, you can typically share patient information without their consent for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. And, and, and these things include care coordination, right? So if you want to coordinate care, um, um, you can do that without having the patient sign a, a written piece of paper allowing information to flow. Um, uh, and, and, but keep in mind that part two, if both part two and HIPAA applies, you have to follow the stricter of the two. So that's part two, right? So even if HIPAA allows it, if part two doesn't allow it, you have to get to follow what part two requires. Next slide, please. Um, just briefly laws again regarding minors. We're looking, talking about Virginia law here. Um, there's some, what's sometimes referred to as minor consent services, and these are services that minors themselves can consent to, they, meaning they consent to the treatment. And this includes substance use disorder and mental health services, um, and certain services related to birth control, family pre planning, pregnancy, and sexually transmitted diseases. So sort of this raises the question, okay, um, a minor consented to services, and, you, and there's, there's a desire to have that minor's information shared with someone else, and you need to consent because part two may require a written authorization. Who, who needs to consent? You know, who's, who's signing that form? Um, and this is Virginia law, but uh, under Virginia law, it's the minor that should sign if it relates to a minor consent services. So that's generally what we're talking about here since that includes substance use disorder uh, services. Um, both the minor and the, and the parent or guardian should sign if it's an inpatient substance use disorder service or inpatient psychiatric service. And otherwise, um, it's the parent or guardian that's signing the form and providing consent. Next slide, please. Um, so just a couple other uh, notable laws here. We, we already talked about the information blocking rule. Uh, again, basically that the rule is, if it's, if it's legal to share information, you should share it um, unless there's exception applies. Um, Briefly, uh, Virginia laws, the Health Records Privacy Act, and then there's a mental health regulation. Um, they typically are, are fairly close to HIPAA, so I don't think for purposes of today's discussion, we have to get into them uh, in, in too much detail and, and that they also have sort of equivalent exceptions for, for purposes of treatment and care coordination. But again, if, if part two applies and, to, uh, and both Virginia law applies and you have to follow the stricter of the two and, and that typically will be part two. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a quick summary of what we've talked about. Who does part two apply to? Um, federally assisted providers that hold themselves out uh, as SUD treatment providers, which means they advertise or they, they have a specialty SUD license. One is con written consent required to share part two information. 
Um, typically it is. For, well, there are, we had a list of exceptions before, um, but uh, the, the, the key is that for purposes of, of treatment and care coordination, you, you need the, uh, the patient sign the form. Uh, and as noted above, noted before, um, even though HIPAA and Virginia law are more flexible when it comes to disclosures for treatment and care coordination purposes, if part two applies, you, you have to follow part two. Mm -hmm. okay. Next slide, please. Okay, and so now we'll, we'll, we'll sort of talk about a few use cases uh, and figure out how this, what this actually means in, in the real world. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Torres with Manette, and I'll be helping Alex out with this uh, section. So, Alex, the first scenario, and, and just to say that these are all informed from real life kind of questions and challenges that you all um, have faced. So we, we did a survey before today's webinar on questions and challenges that, that you all come across in your daily work, and we created a series of use cases here to help that provide some clarity on those um, questions and challenges that, that you have faced. So the first one here has to do with, with a minor, uh, with Sud, who receives a mat from a part two provider. And the, the minor's parent has concerns about mat and asked the part two provider to share information about the minor's treatment with them. So the parent wants more info, uh, wants some info on the treatment that their child is getting. So Alex, in this scenario, um, how does part two and, and some of these other laws apply? Right, so thank you, thank you, Brian. And, and this, is, this is a good example because you, you have Virginia law and part two sort of conflicting a little bit here because you have provisions in Virginia law that are a little more flexible about when parents have a right to obtain information about their children's treatment, but we have to kind of defer to the, to the law, which is more protective of, of the patient's privacy rights, and that's part two here. Um, and part two basically says that if it's a minor consent service, um, the uh, you can't share any information with the parent, right? Um, and, th and this is a this is a you know this is a minor consent service, right? This is one where it uh, under state law the the the, the minor consented to the service, right? Um, so the only circumstance that you could um, share with the parent is if we decide that the minor lacks the capacity to make a rational choice. You know, what does that mean? It's hard to know. Um, obviously, if, if, if you have a, you know, in a, if the child's in a, in a vegetative state or coma, that's, that's a good example. Um, if, but it, it's not something that's likely to come up that often. If, if you, if the minor is, you know, communicative and, and basically seems like they understand what's going on, you're probably not meeting this, this test. And, and basically it's, it's really the, the, the child's choice about whether they want their information to be shared with their, their parent. Um, so, I mean, so basically really this is, this is more of a consent scenario. This is one where um, you really you're talking to the, to the minor about whether they're, will, they're willing to, to share with their, pa their parent. Um, Obviously, if they live in the same house, um, they can have a conversation about their treatment um, without any written consent form. But if, if, the, if the provider needs to provide the actual medical records of the parent, um, they're, they're probably gonna need a, a signed consent from, from the minor. Um, the sort of a related question here is whether, let's, let's say the parent says, okay, I'm not gonna ask the, uh, the part two program, I'm gonna ask the, my managed care plan. Uh, to give me the information. Um, can that managed care plan, which maybe might have paid um, for the service, um, share it with the parent? Um, probably not, basically. It, it gets a little complicated about the legal analysis here, but it's possible the new CARES Act may change this, but, but I think um, it's not, it seems unlikely that the MCO, it, you can do an end run around this issue by, by asking the the MCO for the data. All right, so it's, yeah, it sounds like most cases you will need that minor to sign that, that consent. Great, super helpful. Okay, right, let's go to this next one. Uh, so this has to do with the Medicaid MCO and, and care coordination. So an adult patient of a part two provider, so they're getting services from a provider who is subject to a part two, 
the patient decides, declines to sign a consent form that allows for the disclosure of their uh, SUD information to the Medicaid MCO. So the, the patient signs uh, this disclosure that allows the provider to share information with the MCO. So they decline to do that. The care coordinator with the Medicaid MCO uh, wants information from the Part 2 provider, uh, but the provider declines to, to provide it. Uh, the patient did, however, sign a consent form to allow the Part 2 provider to bill the MCO for those services. So what would happen in this situation where you know, the patient declined to sign this, the consent form to allow the disclosure of their records with their MCO? Um, what, how would the laws apply here? Thanks, Brian. So yeah, this is another sort of issue area where you, you, you probably need cons written consent from the patient. Um, but you know, it's interesting, right? Because keep in mind that it's not only for treatment and care coordination purpose purposes, you generally need consent, you also need it for, for payment purposes, right? So basically the, um, if, if the provider wants to build a plan for the services, they, they're gonna need the patient's consent to send that bill because the bill itself has confidential information. That you're, you're sort of saying this patient receives services from my, my program and you may be providing information on uh, their SUD diagnosis and even if not, you know, it, it, it is part two information. Um, so the so basically the, the potential solution here is having a conversation about what that consent form says, right? Um, you know, um, if you're having a patient sign a form that basically allows disclosures um, for um, payment purposes, uh, why why not have that form allow for disclosures for payment, payment and care coordination purposes as well, right? Um, because basically if, you know, if the patient's willing to have um, their health plan see their information, um, it, it, there's not maybe, maybe not much of a distinction between seeing it to make payment purposes and seeing it to uh, provide care coordination. So this, this might be a solution that the, everyone uh, can discuss and it, it, it may help solve the problem here. Um, and finally, just noted at the bottom is if the, if the provider, it's, if we change the facts a little here and said the provider wasn't subject to part two, um, then you know, we're not worried about part two at all. Um, and then this information probably could be shared with the MCO um, without modifying the consent form. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alex. So again, here it's like that consent form is key and will, will is needed to, for the information sharing. Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, we have, I think one or two more. Uh, yes, so here we have a mental health provider that treats a Medicaid MCO member with schizophrenia. And a care coordinator with the MCO thinks that the member's medications aren't really being properly managed or has concerns there and, and seeks information from that provider. But the provider is not being collaborative and not, and not responding, refuses to, to kind of respond here. Um, Kind of what do the laws say here and what, what options does the care coordinator have? Right, so, so a key question here is whether the, the um, mental health practitioner is subject to part two. Um, you know, it's, it's, pos it's possible this practitioner might be, you know, if, if you provide behavior health services and it's both you know, mental health and substance use disorder counseling. And you, again, if you advertise uh, your services as you know specializing in substance use disorder care, um, that practitioner may be subject to part two. Um, but if we, if we sort of assume that's not what's happening here, it, uh, there's no that there's no ho that holding yourself out element going on. Um, then we, we don't have to worry about part two. And then it's really just a question about uh, complying with HIPAA and Virginia privacy laws, and those generally do allow disclosures. Um, for care coordination purposes without written consent. So you, so you may not need a consent form here. Um, and I just wanna mention the relevancy of the information blocking rule. I mean, this is, this is here how it can change dynamics a little bit, right? Um, and obviously this rule requires a lot of facts and I don't, you know, just, we need to know more here, but, but just know is that we're now moving into an environment um, where uh, providers are, or, if they sort of say, I can't share with you because this law prevents me from sharing it. And if that provider is wrong, if, they, if they're just misquoting the law, um, it's a potential example of, quote, 
you know, information blocking. And, and so there could be um, potential penalties there. Great. Thanks, Alex. Super helpful here. Um, so yeah, it seems like this is a, the facts that matter here and uh, it, the answer is it depends, but, but right. yeah, we're gonna need to share. Okay, um, and I think we have one more of these scenarios to go through. So here um, we have a member of a Medicaid ACO who is receiving ongoing care from a part two provider um, and needs transportation to that program, just he doesn't really have a way to get there. So um, the part two provider uh, that, that treats that member isn't really coordinating with the MCO to arrange for that needed transportation. You know, maybe there's some concerns there like, oh, I don't know if I can share information or what information I can share. So, you know, what, how do the laws apply here and, and what do you see as kind of the options and strategies? Right. So I think in this scenario, the part two provider is, you know, is being you know, reasonable. There, there's a reason why they don't, can't do the coordination. And, and this just shows how broad part two is, right? Even if they're not sharing information about um, the person's diagnosis or anything about treatment, um, the very fact that they're basically telling someone else that this person is coming to our program and we're, we're a substance use disorder program, that itself is part two information, right? And so they kind of can't share it um, and, you know, unless they comply with part two. So, so a couple um, possible answers here. One is, okay, the, the, the part two program, the, the substance use disorder provider has, has to follow part two. But if this person is receiving services from a primary care provider or, or someone else, you know, that, that, that PCP is not probably not subject to part two. So, you know, maybe the PCP could, could uh, handle the coordination for transportation. Um, um, you, second, you could, if you can get consent, that, that would allow the part two program to share. Um, and third, you know, one of those exceptions that um, probably doesn't apply here, but just in theory, could um, is this concept of a qualified service organization and, and that's basically a contractor of a part two program. Um, so if if the part two program contract of the transportation company and basically the contract said, you know, we need help getting our patients to and from our, our, our facility, um, then disclosures can occur to that qualified service organization uh, without written consent. So that's that's another possible avenue right. here. Right. Okay, so it sounds like there are some some strategies here to, to get that patient to to their treatment. Um, just requires some collaboration across some of these providers. Great. Well, thanks, Alex. Um, those are the scenarios that, that we had uh, you know, prior to this. Um, and I think Jocelyn's going to tee up a few more questions that we've gotten in the chat. Yeah, we've actually gotten a bunch. So thank you all for sending them in. And just to say, we will try to get to as many of them as we can. And if we don't get to all of them, you know, we'll check in with Ashley and others to see if there's ways we can um, follow up and provide information after the call as well. So I'm going to start you because this question is coming a bunch. I'm wondering if some people on the phone are parents, um, as I am, of three teenagers. Um, so what is the definition of a minor? Um, kind of who are those minor consent protections applying to? Is there a younger age limit? Like, can a parent really not ask what's going on with their 13 year old? If you could just walk that through, people yeah. have a lot of questions about who a minor is. Yeah, so I think it probably depends on what Virginia law says. And I don't know specifically how Virginia defines a minor. I would assume it's under 18, but I don't, don't quote me on that. That, 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 that could be wrong. Um, but certainly the other thing is like a parent can ask, right? There's the, you know, the parent certainly can ask, there's nothing restricting what a parent can do. Uh, a parent can ask their own child. They, you know, a parent can certainly ask the substance use disorder provider and they, and they could try to find out uh, a way to resolve the problem. It's it just the limitation is on how that part two program can respond to the request. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, again, this, this doesn't come up often in other areas because if you think about something that's clearly not subject to part two, you know, a, a teenager uh, falls, uh, breaks their leg, is in the hospital, the, the, the parent asks the hospital for the teenager's records. Yes, there's basically, you can, the, host, the, the parent can get that, not a problem. It's just, this is 
a spe specific quirk of of this law. And again, I think the idea is that, you know, if a if a fifteen year old uh, can check themselves into substance use disorder treatment, says I need help, they have a right as part of that to prevent their parents from knowing about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I know there's sometimes some parallels with respect to other sensitive topics like yep. birth control and other things, but yep. it sounds like in this instance, both part two and Virginia are clear that there's some extra protections beyond what we would normally have for. And here, and here part two goes further than Virginia law. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, and then we have, a, I'm gonna bop around a little bit, to be honest, because the questions came in on all sorts of things related to these use case scenarios. So Alex, you are in the hot seat. Okay. Um, so I, I think what we're kind of getting is more questions around, like, it seems like at some operational level, you kind of need to bill for services or yeah. you need to sometimes understand what is going on with treatment in an outpatient context to figure out what's appropriate and inpatient. So let me just give you this scenario and maybe you could just talk through a little bit more. It seems like this could potentially really interfere with basic operations, so strategies around it. So the scenario we got is, um, you know, let's say an outpatient substance use disorder clinic is having its clients do regular urine drug screens to see if they're using substances. One of the clients ends up in an inpatient setting or a candidate for an inpatient setting and that inpatient hospital says we can only admit them if we have the record of the outcomes on um, what was happening with those urine drug screens. Yeah. So they kind of want it for clinical reasons. They kind of want it for level of care. Any exceptions there that'll- Yeah, that's, that? that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, just sort of going back to our or a list from earlier. Um, you know, well, well, first of all, let's say, let's go for the easy one. Let's say it's an emergency inpatient treatment, right? And they need to know something about, you know, they need to be admitted right away. I mean, that's that's one exception that could potentially apply here, right? If, if, if they, you know, um, because, and that's sort of what the, the regulations contemplate is that if you, if you need, you know, drug test results understand whether uh, there might be a dangerous drug-drug interaction, right? And you don't have time to go back and ask the patient to consent to that, then it's okay to send that. So that's one exception that could apply here. Um, you know, if it's not an emergency, um, it's, I, I, I'm not sure, um, I would, you know, off the top of my head, I, I can't, I'm not sure. You can't buy my yeah. yeah. Essentially, our senses you would still need consent, even if the stakes are the person might, might not get that inpatient bed, um, that kind of thing. We're yeah, I mean, it's consent. again, it's possible the person, the patient has already signed a consent form that allows for that. I mean, again, I think that sort of goes back to the main question here is that there is no, you can try to write your forms more broadly, right? And 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 the the and you obviously the consent should be voluntary, but if the patient understands what they're signing. They, they can agree to that type of thing up front. Um, and so that's that's often the best solution. Okay, okay, yeah. And we did actually have a commenter and I wanna just share kind of their strategy because I thought it was really helpful and it, it kind of speaks to this, who, um, you know, I reflected that he's done more than 600 intakes at a public, one of the community service board facilities and administers both HIPAA and 42 CFR and has just kind of figured out a process where it starts with an explanation of, of HIPAA and then highlights that at the community service board, there are even more protections and guardrails. And then he goes ahead and gets specific approvals um, and kind of makes sure his clients fully understands and yeah. has worked quite well, it sounds like. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can again if you have a good good conversation up front, that can be the best thing to do. And, and it, again, there's no doesn't the regulation doesn't say the form has to be for one purpose. If they're signing a form that allows you to bill the MCO. They could also say for care coordination or sending to another hospital to allow you to be admitted. You know, there's a lot of different purposes you can include on that form. Mm 
it, it just has to be written correctly. Okay. So maybe one potential takeaway is just, and I'm sure folks do it, and we've got lots of great examples on the phone already, just to really think about that upfront intake process, both yeah. nature of the conversation and how it's framed, and then getting as broad consent as, as you can in a way that's supportive of the patient care. Yeah. Um, sounds like might get us pretty far. That's right. Okay. All right, um, so people were very interested in some of the exceptions, which I know we were gonna whip by, but people, that's a very engaged group, Alex. So yeah, yeah. folks wanted to know about the health information exchange exception. Yeah. We could talk a little bit about that. And yeah. then there's another one too after. So so the health information exchange is not, I mean, we can also go back to the child abuse thing if we wanna do that. Yeah, um, yeah, let's go back to the child abuse. Yeah, so, so start with the health information exchange. It's not an exception. It's still a consent requirement. But the idea seems to be that you don't have to, you know, as mentioned before, you have to name the actual recipient, which is a, can be a real problem sometimes. The idea seems to me that you don't actually have to name the recipient if you, you do it through an HIE. You just name, put the name of the HIE and say, and treating providers that participate in an HIE. Um, I would say this is one I would, that we wish, I think, one area to watch for in the new regulations, assuming they come out at some point. I could imagine this one changing and there being more flexibility here because this is not a statutory requirement. And um, so I think it's possible that could be a broadened a little bit and make it a little easier for the consent forms to, to work. Um, mm -hmm. um, okay. Just going back on the child abuse point, and I just looked it up while we were talking. Um, so I think basically the key is that um, it has to, it, it's, it's, you can report, it, you have to send it to the, it says the appropriate state or local authorities, right? So I think it, um, the real question is sort of what does Virginia law say about child abuse reporting? And if it says, you know, this agency handles requests of child abuse um, and you are um, making the report in compliance with that agency's rules, then that's okay. That's, that's, a, that's a viable part two exception. And in my non-lawyer way, maybe just tell me if this works, Alex, I would say the child protective service requirements trump part two. Like if you have an obligation to report child abuse, there's nothing in part two that interferes with that. So. Yeah, that I think that sounds about right. Um, I just you just what you have to be careful of is not do something go be, you know start reporting child abuse to random people on this. Like you don't want to go to a police officer and and just say oh by this this person you know report abuse if that's not the right person to to receive uh -huh. the reports like that. That's where I think the danger lies. So part two, if you were to not follow kind of the Virginia yeah. protocols and requirements for how you report, um, then you're outside kind of that protected yeah. area and you would be subject to part two. So you can't yeah. kind of come up with your own. I think we should let this person know about the substance use in this family. You need to do it consistent with the child protective service yeah. requirement. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, all right, and then the other exception that folks asked about where you mentioned that there is an exception, and I can't remember if it's an exception to the consent requirement or it's a special consent yeah. for audit purposes. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? And yeah, that's, that's a tricky. Is, like, what do you tell patients about what could happen under the audit? Yeah, system? that's a tricky one. It's, it's, a, it's a little weird. This is one way that part two is weird because it has, and research too, right? You actually have more flexibility for research disclosures under part two than you do under HIPAA in some ways. It's, it's, it's a little backwards, but, but sticking with the audit evaluation, it's actually the regular, I would say the regulation is very complex on this and it's very hard to summarize what it means. Um, you know, I'd say you could have scenarios where like a Medicaid MCO would be able to obtain data from a program under the audit and evaluation exception if they're doing like a quality improvement check or something like that. I just say, I think there's a bit of a line between that and care coordination. You know, think about what the goal is. Is the goal to make sure that patients, that the, the MCO's members are receiving quality services and, and things are going fine? If so, the, that exception might apply versus I want to coordinate the care for this individual person, then that's probably pushing that exception a little too far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. That's helpful. 
Um, and I would just want to come back to it because it's so high stakes and we had a question come in on it. On this child protective services issue, yeah. I just want to clarify, someone did flag, I, it sounds like under Virginia law, if a child is in imminent danger, such as due to exposure to fentanyl, um, yeah. which fentanyl can kill you instantly, um, you know, going to the police is required. Okay. And so therefore, fair, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So part two would not interfere with that, of course. Um, <laughs> so we don't want yeah, to leave the yeah. so do not do yeah. that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it's sorry, right. I, I don't want to just, you know, just, just a general disclaimer that this is not, you know, you know, I'm no expert on Virginia child protective laws. And, and so, you know, mm -hmm. this is yeah. not, you know, this is more of just a background on part two, but yes, that's yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. So I think the takeaway would be Virginia's child protective laws, Trump part two. And yeah. if you've got obligations there, do them, um, right. you know, without worrying about part two implications. So, okay. So we have just a couple minutes left. So I am going to give you just one or two more, Alex. So I think folks are also still just kind of wrestling with that who is subject to part two. And I know you had flagged this issue, like a primary care practice depends on how they hold themselves out. Would you talk a little bit, you know, for someone who is like a private therapist, um, what what are the yeah. kinds of things they should be thinking about? Yeah, about uh, I mean, it, 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 it's a little bit of a gray area, like how far you have to go to cross the line. I mean, certainly mentioning to your patient, let's, if you have a patient who you think needs substance use disorder treatment and saying, you know, I provide counseling on this. I don't think that goes too far i you know i'd, so I'd say one-on-one -on -one patient discussions is probably fine it's just i just say the broader the audience the higher the risk and, and it's sort of you know it, it's I, it, this is something where it's is helpful to speak to your own you know own, own attorneys about but um you know if you're putting up a billboard that says you know you know you know are you an addict call this number that that's probably not a great idea if you're trying to avoid being subject to to part two, um, mm -hmm. even even if you're not licensed as a substance disorder provider. Mm -hmm. And I'll just do a little editorial commentary that this is a place where I think in some ways many of us struggle with making sure we have enough providers for substance use, yeah. and with helping people find providers that are skilled in it. So this is an area where we can see some of those trade offs. You know, it might actually be nice if people could see which therapists have expertise. Um, but it sounds like therapists would need to just weigh how strongly they want to put themselves out there, given that it can affect their part two. Yeah. Um, um, so. But. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna let you go out on one easy one. Okay. Um, so there is a question. Hopefully, it's easy. Final question: um, Is verbal consent allowed? And is verbal consent allowed during COVID, even if it's not allowed during non-pandemic time? Yeah. Time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so under part two, it, it has to be written. Um, so even it's COVID. even during COVID, there's no um, exception for for verbal consent, which I which I know can be a challenge because if you're talking about telehealth, then it's hard to get someone to write it down. Um, but but electronic signatures are okay, right? So okay. it doesn't have to be. This doesn't necessarily have to be in person. It just needs to have some sort of technology that allows you to report that someone signed something either electronically or not. Okay, okay. Appreciate that clarity. Well, wanna thank everyone who participated. Just to confirm, we will be sharing the slides. We're also gonna call through these questions with Ashley and see if we can find some ways of providing additional resources, especially for anything that we missed. But we wanna thank you all for your engagement and I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jocelyn. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks. Thanks.